So our next speaker, we, we're having some technical issues here, folks, so we're doing our best to keep this rolling. But our next speaker is Georgia. And Georgia is uh, a senior research scientist at the RMIT. Georgia, my, my screen's gone blank with your bio on it, so I'm afraid I can't do you the full glory. So uh, welcome, uh, Georgia. If you could go into presentation mode, that'd be great. All right, thanks so much everyone for having me today. Um, I'm going to take us on a bit of a shift now from um, Marta's excellent presentation to think more about some of this, the social science, I guess, that informs resilience in the future. So um, by training, I'm a quantitative ecologist, but what really drives me as a scientist and a researcher is a desire to protect, conserve and enhance biodiversity. And I've found over the years that to do this, I've really needed to expand the scope of my research. And I'm sure this is true also for many conservation scientists within DELP. But as people have come to realise that biodiversity conservation is as much a people problem as it is an environmental one, conservation science, I think, has become a really truly interdisciplinary research field, drawing on theories and methods from a wide range of social and physical sciences. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some advances and some emerging questions in a subset of interdisciplinary conservation science that focuses on understanding and influencing human beh behaviour change. So we know that biodiversity loss is really driven by human behaviour and this is a ra rather depressing figure that shows the number of species threatened by different activities globally according to the IUCN Red List. And you can see that human behaviours are really driving um, the, the significant amount of losses and threats to biodiversity. But while this can feel uh, rather overwhelming and disempowering, the flip side of this knowledge is, I think, more inspiring. That is that the solutions for halting and hopefully reversing biodiversity loss also lie in human behaviours and more specifically in changing human behaviours. So what I'm going to talk briefly about today is some emerging research that helps us to address three key questions. That is, how, uh, which behaviours do we want or need to change? How can we best encourage biodiversity behaviour change? And how do we evaluate the impact of these changes? And the savvy amongst you, I think, will note an alignment here with DELP's biodiversity strategy, which aims to have most Victorians acting for nature by 2037. So the first challenge is to identify desirable behaviour changes. And so this is some recent research led by Dr. Matthew Selinsky at RMIT and undertaken in collaboration with DELP scientists, which identified priority behaviours for behaviour change based on the estimated impact that they would have on Victoria's biodiversity and also the likelihood of uptake of the behaviour amongst the public. So the top right of the quadrant of uh, high impact, highly likely behaviours you can see covers a range of different behavioural domains, which include consumption, lifestyle and stewardship behaviours. And this research was used by DELP to inform their list of priority behaviours that Victorians can take to act for nature. The next step that I want to cover is to find ways to encourage people to make the desired changes. And one way to do this is to think about the way in which we talk about biodiversity and conservation, because one thing that we now know is that how we say stuff really matters. So conservation messaging is an emerging field of research, but luckily for us, uh, RMIT and DELP's own Dr. Alex Kuzminov has done some of the real pioneering research in this space. And he's put together a number of tips for constructing a purposeful, effective conservation message. And this includes things like understanding, in the first place, understanding your audience and emphasise what matters to them. Where possible, use social norms to promote conservation behaviours. But in doing this, be careful not to highlight undesirable behaviours, um, as is uh, demonstrated in the bottom right of the image there. And also try to reduce psychological distance to conservation, which can seem like a really abstract and spatially and socially distant concept to many people. He also suggests that we can leverage useful cognitive biases that people hold, such as the tendency for people to weigh losses more heavily than equivalent gains. And then finally, where possible, try and test your messages before you put them out there um, into the public. 
Some of the recent testing that we've done actually reveals that commonly used frames such as ecosystem services and conservation triage can be really quite devastating when they're used in the wrong context. So some of you may be aware of the growing movement focusing on conservation optimism. The premise behind this movement is that the constant bad news and negative messaging about the loss of biodiversity really leaves people with a feeling of hopelessness and despair that does nothing to inspire them to act. And conservation optimism aims to use positive messages to inspire action for nature. But while there's some truth um, in this premise, the message is not quite that simple. And in fact, both optimistic and pessimistic messages can inspire action or behavior change. Optimistic messages do this by increasing feelings of hope, joy and awe in the audience, while pessimistic messages actually increase the perception of risk. But predicting how and when action will be inspired by pessimistic or optimistic messages really depends on quite a wide range of factors, including the values, attitudes and knowledge that the audience hold, but also their social context and their perception of risk, as well as their sense of personal agency and efficacy. Um, in, in other words, their sense that they can actually do something that will make a difference. But while we have really good foundation of knowledge from public health and climate change research, there's not yet enough knowledge about whether these general rules apply to conservation. And this is something that PhD, Lindell, um, PhD student Lyndall Kidd is working on at RMIT. So the final challenge that I briefly want to highlight is to highlight how we highlight um, how we evaluate the impact of conservation behaviour change. And this is made quite difficult by the fact that that while some behaviours and actions like planting a tree might directly impact biodiversity, most of the impacts of most of behaviours are probably going to be less direct than this. And so we at RMIT have been working with DELP um, scientists, including Fern Hames, Billy Geary and Rich Faulkner, to estimate both the direct and indirect biodiversity benefits of some priority target behaviours like wildlife gardening. Um, and this is just some unpublished results um, where we used DELP specific needs analysis to demonstrate that there's a positive but uncertain indirect benefit of wildlife gardening for southern brown bandicoots associated with uh, the building of social capacity, development of social norms um, and promotion of volunteering. So I'll leave it there and um, thank you for having me and I really look forward to hearing um, some more of the presentations today. Thank you.